In 1936, Adolf Hitler had pulled off some pretty impressive manoeuvres in the world of foreign policy. He had always wanted an alliance with England above all, but unfortunately for him, there was only a few in England who felt the same way. As a result, he was forced to look elsewhere, and the elsewhere in question would only ever be Italy. Hitler had always admired Mussolini, not necessarily for his politics, but for the way he had seized power in such dramatic fashion and held on to it. He wasn't without his criticism for the Duce, but he always loved the man and wished to be on good terms. Mussolini certainly didn't feel the same way, and instead had opted for a policy of jumping into bed with Britain and France for years. In fact, he had even outright denounced Germany for breaching the Versailles Treaty, which was rather hypocritical, given that one of the main reasons that Mussolini came to power was due to the Italians' distaste at what they walked away with from the Versailles peace conferences themselves. Regardless, all this fell apart when Italy marched into Ethiopia. Mussolini was now viewed as a kind of modern imperialist, a relic of a previous time, despite the fact that this previous time was only a couple of decades ago, when Western nations could take whatever pieces of Africa and Asia they pleased, didn't seem to mean anything to the biggest empire on planet Earth, the British Empire. They quickly embargoed Italy, albeit not very effectively. But the more important aspect was that now the two countries were on terrible terms. Britain had lost a potentially valuable ally in their attempted containment of Germany over an African kingdom which still practiced slavery in the year 1935. Hitler quickly took advantage of this state of affairs giving arms to the Ethiopians to prolong the war, but also giving raw materials to Mussolini. The Spanish Civil War came along the following year, and here too, Hitler and Mussolini found common cause. Shortly afterwards, the two nations announced that they would now follow a common foreign policy. The Axis was born. Mussolini was now almost on side, and seemingly quickly changing his tune towards Hitler. The Saar and the Rhineland had been reclaimed, Many in Britain were even beginning to view Hitler with sympathy, and things in general seemed to be looking up. But Hitler's fortunes seemed to change year by year, and 1937 was a new year. Would the new year bring a continuation of this good fortune, or would it bring about the disaster? Before we begin, a quick disclaimer as always. This is a video about Adolf Hitler, the most controversial man in history, but that doesn't mean that this video needs to be. This is purely a work of history, and I'll be including no opinion of my own, or any politics. Please don't overthink it. Also, this video is part of a larger series on the life of Adolf Hitler, from birth till death. This episode just happens to be covering 1937. If you'd like to start from the start, however, you're more than welcome to do so, and the link will be in the description. The playlist is also front and centre on my channel homepage. And finally, as always, a gigantic thank you to my Patreon, Subscribestar, and YouTube members who keep this channel afloat. This channel is almost entirely run by donations and subscriptions, as the videos aren't monetized until after a manual review, which can take a week. So without these kind people, this channel wouldn't be here. If you enjoy the videos, would like to join the Discord, our weekly Hearts of Iron 4 games, or even our new state-of-the-art Minecraft server, then please consider signing up in the link in the description. Even the $2 tier helps massively. Thank you. Three months after Adolf Hitler's famous four-year anniversary of being in the Chancellery speech in 1937, he made another speech, but this time to a more tight-knit audience, his 800 district leaders at the opening of a new school for children of the NSDAP leadership. He spoke of his political strategy and his vision for Germany. Whilst a bit of a footnote in history and not often mentioned, the talk was rather illuminating if we are to understand Adolf Hitler's philosophy. An organisation only has a future if it subdues in a natural manner the freedom of the individual so that the whole benefits." End quote. He then moved on to discuss other authorities. He felt nothing should come above the nation, quote, no matter what it is, not even the church, end quote. Then he moved on to the benefits of dictatorships over democracy. He compared democracy to an anthill, where everyone was running off in their own direction, doing what they wished. As a result, they were worthless as individuals, and the nation as a whole suffered. He said of such individuals and the system at large, quote, They are soft. They are not worth anything. They have no resistance. Only the Jew could have fought up and introduced such idiocy, end quote. The leaders of tomorrow were then spoken of. Who would succeed the Fuhrer? He spoke in a way that sounded reminiscent of his own upbringing, quote, It is only necessary to have ability. It matters not what their fathers are, what their mothers were. They only must have the stuff of leadership in them. 
Pure abstract thinking is of no value. The Führer must be able to lead. He must be able to say, this has to be done, I recognize it. He must consult with those men responsible for carrying out his plan, but in the final analysis, it is he who must stand up for his ideas and decisions. He must make the decision." End quote. This was Adolf Hitler through and through. National socialism was all about the larger German whole. Everyone was equal in that sense. This may have been toxic to outsiders, as obviously they would be excluded or even mistreated, but if you were German, you were now in the most meritocratic and equal society in the world. Adolf Hitler had never cared much for royalty. To him, it was a ridiculous concept. In theory, sure, a king's son trained from birth should result in a great leader, if it's all he's ever been taught to do. But was this the reality? Is that what history has shown? To Hitler and many others, the answer was no. To them, the leader must be a man of the people, the common man. There was no room for pageantry or ego. There was just action. Hitler himself lived in a Spartan lifestyle, rushing from place to place, living in rooms consisting of just a small iron bed with no decorations except a picture of his mother. Hitler didn't even take a salary. It certainly wasn't a life of luxury. This was not the royalty of old. This was something new. He believed society as a whole must be designed in a way so that those individuals with the spark for leadership could be allowed to flourish and rise up to one day be in a position to lead, or at least play an important role. He ended the speech by saying, quote, I want the German people to emerge as the strongest people in Europe, not the second or third. And even if this sacrifice fails, it will not be, in my eyes, the last chapter of German history, but the next to last chapter. We shall write the last chapter." End quote. After the collapse in Germany at the end of the Great War, a new culture took over, Weimar culture. Today, it is seen as a sort of precursor to our own modern culture in the West. Norms were tested and tradition was done away with. This was a world of drugs, sex and depravity before the rest of the Western world would experience such things decades later. The rich from all over Europe would flock to Berlin to fulfill whatever strange erotic fantasies they might have had. The currency was so weak that with a few US dollars, you could pretty much buy whatever you wanted. One aspect of this culture was modern art. To most people at the time, Hitler among them, this new kind of art was disgusting. So it should be no surprise that when he came to power, he wanted it done away with. He quickly had the Bauhaus disbanded, an institution founded by Walter Gropius, which essentially catered for all things modern art. Gropius himself ran off to England on a self-imposed exile. As an architect, Gropius would later give invaluable information on how German houses were designed to the RAF, so that the RAF could more efficiently bomb German houses. More specifically, he showed the Allies the best way to use their incendiary bombs to set fire to these homes, and by extension, the German families inside of them. On the other end of the spectrum, Hitler's favourite architect was Professor Paul Ludwig Troost. He said to Troost's wife, that once he came to power and became leader of the German people, he would call on her husband, whose work had, quote, clarity, strength, and nobility. Once Hitler came to power, Troost's neoclassical work became the NSDAP style, and their architecture would be based on his from now on. One of his most famous projects for Hitler was a modern art museum in Munich. Hitler himself had laid the cornerstone in autumn 1933. Sadly for Troost, he died shortly afterwards. His wife would carry on his work, however, and her and Hitler got on very well. Hitler would regularly consult her at her studio, and the two could happily joke together. She wasn't a big fan of Hitler's other, and now main architect, Speer, however. One day, she was asked what she thought of him, and she said that if Hitler asked her husband for a building of 100 meters, Troost would reply that it could only be 96 meters, for structural and aesthetic reasons. Speer, on the other hand, would reply, yes, mein Führer, 200 meters, and that Hitler would reply, you are my man. Hitler joined in with the laughter of those around him after these comments, and she would later recall, quote, Hitler had a really good sense of humour, from the heart and not, as Speer says, sarcastic, end quote. Only very few people could talk to Hitler in this way. In summer 1937, Hitler opened the Haus der Deutschen Kunst, the house of German art. The building was opened with a parade through the streets of Munich, celebrating 2,000 years of German culture. He declared that this place had been designed for the art of the German people, not for international art. He said, quote, The new age of today is at work on a new human type. Men and women are to be more healthy, stronger. There is a new feeling of life, a new joy of life, end quote. 
He then proceeded to compare the German style of art to that of these new modern artists. He said their work only produced, quote, misinformed cripples and cretins, women who inspire only disgust, men who are more like wild beasts, children who, were they alive, must be regarded as cursed of God, end quote. And, quote, one has but to ask how the defect of vision arose, and if it is hereditary, the Minister of the Interior will have to see to it that so ghastly a defect of vision shall not be allowed to perpetuate itself. Or if those who do not believe in the reality of such impressions, and seek on other grounds to impose this humbug upon the nation, then it is a matter for a criminal court." End quote. To Hitler and the party, art such as this was referred to by the term degenerate art. Thousands of works had been confiscated when the party had come to power, including painters such as Picasso and Van Gogh. Many of these were then displayed in a degenerate art exhibit in Munich. The work was hung up without frames, with comments accompanying them reading, Thus did sick minds view nature, or German peasants looked at in the Yiddish manner. Another section of the exhibit contained, quote, Negro art. Another was Marxist, and another, larger one, was devoted to Jewish artists, who seemed to be heavily overrepresented in modern art at the time. The exhibition was hugely popular. It toured the nation, and over two million visitors paid to view this strange collection. One outraged visitor exclaimed, the artists ought to be tied to their pictures so that every German can spit in their faces, end quote. This viewpoint was far from uncommon. Nineteen thirty seven's Nuremberg Party Congress opened on the sixth of September with the theme The Rally of Labour to celebrate the reduction in unemployment since the party had come to power. The events were opened with a typical Hitler proclamation, read out by Adolf Wagner. He contrasted the Bolshevik Revolution to the National Socialist one. The former had been a bloody, violent mess, resulting in the deaths of millions, maybe even ten million, as well as millions of refugees. The latter, by contrast, had been almost bloodless. He then spoke of how in the West and the East, communism was growing. France was constantly crippled by strikes and socialist agitation. Meanwhile, the Soviet Union in the East continued to grow in power. To the Southwest in Spain, you had a bloody civil war, pitting communism against what I suppose you could call Christian fascism under Francisco Franco. Quote, the whole world may begin to burn around us, but the National Socialist state will emerge from the Bolshevist conflagration like platinum, end quote. It wasn't one of the more famous rallies, which was probably reflected by the movie covering that year's rally, and in fact, the previous one. Together, they only came to 21 minutes. Hitler had something else on his mind, wooing Mussolini. On the 25th of September, Il Duce arrived in a fascist militia uniform designed for the occasion at Munich's main train station, where he was greeted by Hitler himself. The crowd shouted out, Hail Duce, and the duo were driven to Hitler's apartment, where they had their first conversation. Mussolini spoke German, so that was the language they talked in. Schmidt, Hitler's interpreter, didn't have a very busy time, and was able to compare the two men. Hitler's voice was, quote, rough and often hoarse as he flung out sentences full of rolling R's either at me or at Mussolini. Sometimes his eyes blazed suddenly, and then equally suddenly became dull, as if in a fit of absent-mindedness, end quote. Mussolini, on the other hand, was, quote, firmly erect, swaying from the hips as he talked. His Caesarian head might have been modelled from the old Romans, with its powerful forehead and broad square chin thrust forward under a wide mouth. He had much more vivacious expression than Hitler when his turn came to thunder against the Bolsheviks or the League of Nations. Indignation, contempt, determination and cunning alternately lit up his mobile face and he had the histrionic sense native to Latins, end quote. According to Schmidt, the two were also different simply in their laughs. Hitler seemed sarcastic, whereas Mussolini seemed free and wholehearted. Throughout their talk, the most important topic was their new common foreign policy. They agreed to be friendly to Japan, to support Franco, and to together thwart the ambitions of France and Britain. This last point made it obvious that Hitler was perhaps almost giving up, at least for now, on his hope for an alliance with Britain. He would try again later, in very different circumstances, however. After their only political discussion of the visit, Mussolini was taken to a series of ceremonies and appearances, including the parade of goose-stepping SS men, which apparently Mussolini was greatly impressed by and never forgot. Others included army manoeuvres in Mecklenburg and an inspection of the Krupp works in Essen. 
The culmination of the tour was on September the 28th. Hitler and Mussolini's trains pulled up next to each other on an adjacent track heading for Berlin, and the two trains ran side by side for 15 minutes. The drivers had practiced for two days beforehand, and the Germans and Italians were able to talk freely between the two trains. Just as they reached the platform, Hitler's train sped ahead so he could quickly get out and be ready to greet Mussolini with an outstretched hand as his train came to a stop. It all went off with perfection and gave off the impression that Hitler had wanted. A million spectators lined the avenue from the train station to the centre of Berlin, which had been covered with fascist and national socialist flags. Work was stopped at 4pm and the population was able to make it to the event, or even, in some cases, special trains would take people from other towns just so they could see. 60,000 SS men were required to hold back the sheer number of people, as well as many plain-clothed men within the audience. Mussolini was absolutely delighted by the cheers from the crowd as the two men stood side by side in an open car, cruising down the avenue. The next day, the two men drove to the Olympic Stadium, as Mussolini had wanted to meet the German people personally. The Führer allowed Mussolini to enter first so he could have his moment of private adulation from the crowd before he followed, and made an introductory speech to the quote, 115 million citizens of our two countries who are sharing with deep emotion in this historic event, end quote. He said that these people were a quote, community, not only of opinion, but also action. Germany is once again a world power. The strength of our two nations constitutes the strongest guarantees for the preservation of a civilized Europe, true to her cultural mission and armed against disruptive forces, end quote. Then it was Mussolini's turn, although people could barely understand what he was saying, as he spoke not only in German, but also really fast, as he was very excited. Regardless, quote, The Berlin-Rome axis was formed in the autumn of 1935, and during the last two years, it has worked splendidly for the ever closer association of our two peoples and for European peace, end quote. He then went on to explain that his visit was not a diplomatic or political episode, but a demonstration of unity between two revolutions with a common purpose. The skies then opened and heavy rain fell upon the stadium. Regardless, everyone stood through till the end and listened eagerly to Mussolini's speech, which was disintegrating in his hand. Quote, the greatest and most genuine democracies that the world knows today are Germany and Italy. I have a friend. I go with him through thick and thin to the very end." end quote. He then set off back to his hotel, albeit slowly in an open-topped car so the population could see him before he left. He had no raincoat and arrived absolutely soaked, but the visit had done its job. I'm sure he didn't mind. He had arrived in Berlin extremely skeptical of Hitler, even looking at him with disdain as he always had. After this visit, however, he had a sudden change in opinion. He was fascinated by the goose-stepping soldiers and the miles and miles of adoring civilians, just happy to be a part of this period in history. He had never seen such genuine adoration of a people for their leader. From now on, it was as if the roles had reversed. Mussolini had always felt better than Hitler, whilst Hitler had always seemed to be trying to impress Mussolini. Now, it was the other way around. The student had become the master. It would now be Mussolini trying to impress Hitler. As time passed, this dynamic would become more and more visible. Whilst the visit wasn't inherently political, there were some key rough agreements. Italy could have a free hand in the Mediterranean, and Germany, supposedly, could finally, after all these years, have their free reign in the place closest to Hitler's heart, Austria. The meeting couldn't possibly have gone any better. Whilst the Axis had been formed before this, it was now an official reality. The two men declared that their nations were now, quote, immune against any attempt to separate them. On the 28th of May 1937, 68-year-old Neville Chamberlain was made Prime Minister of the United Kingdom. He said before accepting the role, quote, Our objective should be to set out the political guarantees which we want as a general settlement, and if the discussions have to break down, we want the breakdown to be due to Germany's refusal to accept our reasonable requirements in the political field, end quote. Around this time, he also said in a private letter, quote, I believe the double policy of rearmament and better relations with Germany and Italy will carry us safely through the danger period if only the foreign office will play up, end quote. Chamberlain seemed far more conciliatory to Hitler and Germany. He genuinely didn't want war and appeared to be a genuinely good person, just trying to do what he thought was right. As far as we're aware, Chamberlain wasn't your average British politician like Churchill, 
who was happy to plunge his nation into war for personal gain from wealthy figures behind the scenes. Eden, the foreign minister, however, could have been one of these types. Chamberlain wasn't a very domineering figure and didn't have much control of his cabinet. In the end, he would be walked all over by people like Churchill and Eden, who abandoned any pretense of peace years ago and openly agitated for war against Hitler's Germany. As for Churchill, it is clear that even this early, he was being openly paid by men in the city of London, such as Sir Henry Strakosch, to agitate for war, and there can be no debate about his intentions. He was blatant and seemed proud of the fact. Eden was much milder, albeit still agitating, but it isn't clear that he was being paid personally. Him and Churchill worked so closely together later on though, that it is certainly fishy. Back in 1937, however, Chamberlain's willingness to work with Hitler was tested when Lord Halifax, Lord President of the Council, was invited to go on a hunting expedition with Hermann Goering. Chamberlain thought it was a good idea, and Halifax set off with a vision of sounding out Hitler for an understanding. The choice couldn't have been worse. Halifax was a very naive, posh type, completely out of his depth in Germany. He knew almost nothing of German history and the German character. He had never even read Mein Kampf. Essentially, the greatest chance of an understanding between Britain and Germany so far was being left in the hands of, for lack of a better word, a posh, out-of-depth British aristocrat. The Third Reich was built on the premise of all Germans being equal. There was no more aristocracy. The two would be chalk and cheese. Halifax ended up liking Goering, and even Goebbels, who he expected to deeply dislike. He was even given an extremely warm welcome by the local Berliners. On November the 19th, he set off from his hunting trip to meet Hitler at the Berghof. He arrived and was warmly greeted by Hitler, who insisted on giving him a tour of his mountain retreat before they sat down for business. Halifax got off to a terrible start, quote, I have brought no new proposals from London. I have chiefly come to ascertain the German government's views on the existing political situation and to see what possibilities of a solution there might be, end quote. Perhaps Hitler was expecting something solid. Either way, upon hearing these words, he frowned so angrily that Schmidt, his interpreter, thought he looked like he was about to start sulking. Hitler began to talk of his demands before complaining that the British press, who had always, at every opportunity, opposed Hitler due to personal grudges, had tried to sabotage the meeting before it had even begun. Halifax, in response, defended the freedom of the press in Britain. The two calmed down and then Halifax praised Hitler for keeping communism out of Germany and said that he hoped the British, the French, the Germans and the Italians could lay a solid peace foundation. He then moved on to the situation in Central and Eastern Europe, which Eden had warned him not to. This opened the door for Hitler, who thought that he could now talk frankly. He wanted a close union with Austria, whether that be an economic union or a complete union. He wanted the end of the suppression of the ethnic Germans in Czechoslovakia, and lastly, he wanted freedom to extend economic relations with southeastern and eastern Europe. He claimed that on this last point, Britain had been constantly interfering, quote, Obstacles are being repeatedly put in my way in southeastern Europe by the Western powers, and political ambitions, which I have never entertained, are attributed to me, end quote. Halifax tried to reassure Hitler, and stated that England was always open to solutions not based on force, and then importantly, slipped up and said, quote, that also applies to Austria. Almost immediately, Halifax could see the gears turning in Hitler's head, and knew he had just made a big mistake and admitted British policy regarding Austria, Germany's number one target. Hitler regained his composure quickly, however, and reminded Halifax that force would never be on the table in Austria's case, as it was the population themselves who wanted a union. The Austrian government only stood in the way. By lunchtime, Schmidt, the interpreter, felt that the battle for peace was lost and that the two men were getting nowhere. He later explained that he would constantly try to get conversations going, but they all seemed to falter. Halifax had to use the interpreter, and things just weren't flowing properly. Halifax was very out of his depth, and Hitler was very grumpy. Later, he began to chastise Halifax for his hunting. Quote, I can't see what there is in shooting. You go out armed with a highly perfected modern weapon, and without risk to yourself, kill a defenseless animal, end quote. He continued on and suggested that hunters should just kill a cow in the slaughterhouse to save themselves the trouble. I phoned Kirkpatrick from the British Embassy in Berlin recalled Hitler's behaviour, quote, in short, he behaved throughout like a spoiled, sulky child, end quote. They then went downstairs and Hitler was served a large cup of hot chocolate topped by a massive island of whipped cream whilst the others had coffee and watched the SS men demonstrate to the visitors how the gigantic picture window could be lowered in the Berghof. 
Nothing more was said politically, and the evening had appeared to be a dismal failure. On the train back to Berlin, Halifax confided that Hitler had bewildered him. He wrote in his diary that evening, quote, He gave me the impression of feeling that, whilst he had attained power only after a hard struggle with present-day realities, the British government was still living comfortably in a world of its own making, a fairyland of strange, if respectable, illusions. It clung to shibboleths, collective security, general settlement, disarmament, non-aggression pacts, which offered no practical prospect of a solution to Europe's difficulties." End quote. Before he went back to England, however, he had one more talk with Goering, and he managed to assure Halifax that Germany did not want to use force under any circumstances. After this, Halifax fell into the appeasement camp, although later he would begin to lean more towards intervention in order to prevent the economic domination of Europe by Germany as they were growing too powerful. For now, however, he returned home and said to the cabinet, quote, the Germans had no policy of immediate adventure. They were too busy building up their own country, which was still in a state of revolution, end quote. Hitler seemed to believe he had won Halifax over and later said about Halifax's meeting, quote, I have always said that the English will get under the same Ada down with me. In their politics, they follow the same guidelines as I do, namely, the overriding necessity to annihilate Bolshevism, end quote. I must add that the recollection of events seems a little strange to me. Our source here is Halifax, as he was alive to tell the tale after the war. In his recollections, he, as we just saw, makes it out as if the entire meeting was a disaster, and that Hitler behaved like a child. But according to his diary, and the way he spoke back home to Chamberlain says otherwise, if Hitler was as bad as he said, and there is no way appeasement would have ever been attempted based on the success of their talks. So I would take Halifax's post-war recollections with a grain of salt. He was writing them in a post-war Britain, still high on war propaganda after all, the cause of many misrememberings in historical accounts. After this, it was approaching Christmas, usually a miserable time for Hitler, as he had watched his mother wither and die from cancer in front of a Christmas tree. But this year, he was in a great mood. In his eyes, it had been a good year. On Christmas Eve, he snuck off with Krauss, his valet, passed the SS guards on the stairs, and they jumped into a waiting taxi. Krauss recalled, quote, No one saw us, and Hitler was quite relieved. I wanted to sit next to the driver, but Hitler grabbed my arm, and I got in the back with him, end quote. For two hours, they then toured Munich, before telling the driver to head to the Lutpold Café. The driver had no idea who these difficult customers were, and as soon as he had his fare, he quickly sped off, probably glad to be rid of them after two hours of aimless driving. Again, Krauss recalled, quote, He probably thought we were a couple of nuts. Probably not too unjustifiably so. The whole thing struck me as pretty peculiar too, end quote. Instead of going into the cafe, Hitler set off for the Konigsplatz. Krauss kept looking around nervously, so Hitler said to him, quote, Don't be afraid. No one would believe that Adolf Hitler would be walking here alone in Munich, end quote. Regardless, he kept his head down whenever anyone passed. They continued on their walk around Munich, until eventually, they arrived back at his apartment. Hitler seemed like a delighted schoolboy, as if he had finally taken the weight off his shoulders and was able to live normally again, if just for a few hours. The next day, however, Krauss was reprimanded by Himmler for participating and ordered that all plans must be reported, even if Hitler forbade it. By year's end, Prime Minister Chamberlain had made up his mind on appeasement. He saw it as the only way to bring about a lasting peace in Europe. After all, he felt, a lot of Germany's claims were pretty justified, and the British public even supported some of them. It was time to work with Hitler. Quote, The conversations between Lord Halifax and Herr Hitler showed that, if we wish for a general settlement with Germany, it will be for us, and not for the German government, to take the next step by putting forward some concrete proposals. The next step, therefore, lies with us. It is important, if we are really anxious to prevent the hopes created by the recent conversations from evaporating, that we should keep moving, that there should be no long delay. We must keep moving." End quote. These concrete proposals were completely out of touch fantasies, however. They show how out of touch England was at the time, and how little they understood Hitler, his worldview, and his goals. Some of the proposals were bribes, such as offering Hitler land that wasn't even Britain's to give. A large section of Africa, owned by Belgium or Portugal, was one idea that was floated. And then in Europe, perhaps some concessions to Sudeten Germans in Czechoslovakia could buy Hitler off. Whilst the English ideas were a total joke, Hitler was dead serious. Things were getting much worse for the Germans living in Czechoslovakia, and Hitler wanted something done about it now. His own army was getting cold feet, however, 
and were worried about future conflict. Luckily for Hitler, a crisis arose. General von Blomberg decided he wanted to marry his secretary, a one-time prostitute named Erna Gruen. After a brief fling, the field marshal, who had been a widow for six years, decided he wanted to marry her. On January the 12th, this became a reality in a room in the war ministry, and they were married with Hitler and Goering as witnesses. The two then headed off on their honeymoon as if nothing was wrong. Back home, however, rumours sprung up almost as soon as they set off about his wife's past. The Berlin police found that she had not only posed for pornographic photographs before, but that she had also had a record as a prostitute. Hitler was furious to be caught up in such a state of affairs by his own commander-in-chief. He felt he had been tricked and made to act as a witness purely so he could quash the inevitable rumours that would arise. He then ordered Goering to tell Blomberg what was going on and demanded that he dissolve the marriage. The logical successor to Blomberg if he refused to divorce was General von Fritsch. When Goering returned to Hitler, however, he came with a dossier given to him by Himmler and Heydrich. The dossier claimed that Fritsch had committed homosexual acts with two Hitler youth boys and a male prostitute named Bavarian Joe. Hitler had never been a fan of these two, and this perhaps lent him to believe these rumours more readily. Goering's motives probably weren't so squeaky clean too, as he was probably next in line of succession logically. Blomberg, as expected, refused to annul the marriage, and almost immediately as the news broke, the army HQ began to be bombarded with phone calls from prostitutes, delighted with the success of one of their own. The army, which had let General von Schleicher and von Bredo, two of their own, be murdered by Hitler on the night of the Long Knives without the slightest murmur, now lost their minds at the tainting of their honour. They demanded Blomberg resign at once. Back at home, Hitler was furious, and according to Wiedemann, his adjutant, quote, he walked up and down the room, hand behind back, a heartbroken man, whilst mumbling over and over, if a German field marshal marries a whore, then anything in this world is possible, end quote. Hitler then called Hosbach, another of his adjutants, into the room, and they discussed Blomberg's successor. Hosbach tried desperately to explain that the charges against Fritsch were made up, and demanded to be able to inform the man himself of the charges against him. Hitler told him, absolutely not, but Hosbach went right to Fritsch's apartment and did so anyway. The general was furious, quote, If Hitler wants to get rid of me, then he only has to say the word and I will resign, end quote. The next day, Wiedemann was asked to present Hitler with a proposal for a new successor by Goering. The successor was Goering. Hitler bluntly replied, quote, By no means. Goering doesn't even know how to hold an inspection. I know more about it than he does, end quote. Later that day, Blomberg himself even suggested that the post be given to Goering. Again, Hitler was blunt. He complained that Goering was too impotent and lazy. In reply, Blomberg suggested that Hitler take the post himself. Hitler didn't accept or deny the post just yet, but asked Blomberg who was in charge of his staff in order to find a man to take over. The reply came as General Wilhelm Keitel before he quickly added that the man, who was the father-in-law of his own daughter, wasn't even remotely suitable for such a position. Quote, he's nothing but the man who runs my office, end quote. Hitler replied, that's exactly the man I'm looking for. Blomberg went back to his office and appeared, quote, absolutely shattered and near collapse. He told Keitel about the events and confessed to knowing all along about his wife's past before adding, quote, but that was no reason for casting a woman out forever, end quote. He said that Hitler and he had parted on amicable terms and that Hitler had promised that if war broke out, he could once again be at the Fuhrer's side. Keitel then suggested a divorce for the children's sake, but Blomberg said that the two were too in love to do so. This was purely a love marriage, not the political one that could be thrown away. He said that he would, quote, rather put a bullet in his head than that, end quote, and ran out of the room with tears in his eyes. At 5pm that day, Keitel was invited to Hitler's study. They discussed everything that had happened so far. Keitel explained that the army would never have accepted Blomberg's marriage, and then the topic of the succession came up again. Goering was once more put forward. Again, Hitler objected. Then Keitel said Fritsch, and Hitler quickly showed him the charges which had been signed by the Minister of Justice. He then told Keitel that he was going to confront Fritsch directly with the evidence, and he duly did so that same evening. Fritsch knew none of the details about the alleged acts with the Hitler Youth Boys or Bavarian Joe. He could barely believe what he was hearing. He explained that the accusation about the two boys was a ridiculous misunderstanding. He said that he had simply invited the two boys to dinner before and given them lessons in map reading. Then, strangely admitted to giving the boys a light tap on the bottom with a ruler if they proved to not be attentive during the lessons. 
The issue was, these two youngsters were completely different boys to the one Hitler was even accusing Fritsch of. Perhaps understandably, Hitler fired him on the spot. Before the general had even got out of the study, Hitler was telling Wiedemann about the events, quote, Imagine Wiedemann, all of a sudden, it was not only two boys, but four he was mixed up with. The case cannot be kept secret any longer, end quote. The next day, Keitel and Hitler once again discussed the succession. This time, Hitler gave in and said that he would accept the post himself and that Keitel would remain as his chief of staff. The new post came with a rough task, however. Keitel was to fire Hossback for going behind Hitler's back a few days earlier to Fritsch. Hitler never wanted to see his previous adjutant again. The following week, Hitler ordered a full Gestapo investigation of Fritsch and General von Brauchitsch was chosen as the new commander in chief. The general was having issues at home, however, and he revealed to Hitler that he was in the middle of a brutal divorce and that his wife, seen to be ex-wife, was demanding 80,000 marks. Hitler personally gave the general the money and persuaded his ex-wife to accept the terms. The general's new wife, who had already lined up, was a quote, 200% rabid Nazi, which only added to Hitler's decision. In fact, the army as a whole didn't trust the man due to his extreme national socialist leanings. The whole thing had been a total mess, but it was coming to a close. The German people were informed over the radio that Blomberg and Fritsch had resigned, 16 high-ranking generals had been dismissed, and that 44 more had been transferred to other posts. The clean-up didn't stop here. Foreign Minister von Neurath was replaced as Foreign Minister by Ambassador to England von Ribbentrop. And so, by very early 1938, Hitler had managed to remove those he didn't trust in the army and got out unscathed. The army had always been an issue for him. They were an extremely close-knit group who were stuck in their ways and very sceptical of Hitler, but he'd managed to pull off this minor purge without them going into full-scale revolt. He was now ready to make serious diplomatic moves without having to worry about his army letting him down. He had also secured a proper deal with Mussolini, and the two of them now knew where the others stood. They were united in foreign policy. After five years, he was finally secure both in terms of allies and in terms of the army. He could now make his second gigantic step into foreign policy after the Rhineland. It was time to bring the Austrians home. Thank you very much for watching, and I'm very excited to be finally reaching the Anschluss next episode. From here, we are officially in the thick of things, and there'll be no going back for Adolf Hitler. I greatly appreciate the support so far, and it means the world. As always though, the biggest thank you of all goes to my Patreon, Subscribestar, and YouTube members who keep me and the channel afloat. My income from this channel comes almost solely from subscriptions, and without them, there is no Zuma Historian channel. So if you do enjoy these videos, want to join our Discord, our weekly Hearts of Iron 4 games, or the brand new Minecraft server, then please do consider clicking one of the links in the description. Even the $2 tier helps more than you can imagine. Thank you. Thank you to Lobster to you, Darwe Lalalal, Sigma, Emperor Titus, Luke David Murphy, Chechen Natsok, Anton Berglund, Levi E, Friendly Brian, Mr. Malabar, Bushak, Firefly Enterprise, Mr. Bloom, Gav D, Gaius Longanese Hanno, JD, Green Rebel, Angus Roxborough, Rocksacker Too Heavy, Alexios Podcast Watcher, Citadel, Haste, Bojan M, Rick Me, Mr. Gaming, Cameron, Sludwig 1919, Gloomy, Troy Hasa, Jagged Kampf, Rowan, Swedish Chef, It's Okay to Be a Nationalist, Inflection Point, The Waller, Suma Klubiek, and Jorgen 1997.